I don't know how to say. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Welcome back to to another session of Addiction in the Three Principles. Uh, My name is Greg Suki. I'm here with uh, my co-host, Harry Derbisky. And uh, we're really excited today to to bring Reed and Krista Smith on. Um, These two were really a, a pivotal part of my beginnings in the three principles. We spent a lot of Monday nights with them laying in bed on this uh, on this webinar we used to do. And it just out of the, the clarity that they had in sharing these principles and, and Reed's poop jokes and, <laughs> and stuff like that. I don't know, it just, it really helped, it really helped bring these principles into perspective. They weren't quite as much of, of an abstract thing as, as what they really are anyway, but they were really, very helpful uh, among other people, uh, Jeff Raiders on this on this webinar, Chris Noonan. I mean, there's there's quite a few people that used to join us for those. That I don't know it's just such a great feeling, and that's what uh, the, when Harry and I decided to start this webinar series, that's what we wanted to create here was more of that discussion feeling, that that warm you know let's hang out in our living room, but you know not have to clean up after guests kind of feeling, and. Uh, it, it seems like we're we're achieving that. Our, our YouTube channel is very quickly approaching 20,000 views, which is just mind-blowing to me. But I, I really wanted to bring Reed and Chris on because so they've been doing a tremendous amount of work uh, with, with treatment for addiction. And they recently opened up their own treatment center, which is really exciting. And I only recently found out about it because we haven't really talked much lately. So I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, I guess let's go ahead and start there. So that'd be a great place to start and then we'll kind of open up the conversation. Uh, real quick, I just I have everybody muted just to keep down on background noise. So if you have a question or comment at any point, please feel free to just, you know, butt in and interrupt. Or uh, in the participant tab, there's a raise hand feature. And if you click that, then you know, I'll call it calling you and get your work in. So what's been going on lately? You guys have, uh, you guys have really, uh, really been moving forward. <laughs> I like what you're up to. Yeah, well, we've missed our Monday nights, but like you said, we've been pretty busy. Um, we moved to the Atlanta, Georgia area um, <clears throat> to open our own facility. And it is an outpatient facility Um, It's the only one in the state of Georgia that uses um, mindfulness principles as an outpatient program. Um, And we opened in August, so we've been busily training, um, you know, our staff and clinicians and, um, you know, just getting everything in in line. Um, Of course, uh, those of you who know us know that we've been doing recovery principles in the recovery for um, about five years now, and um, yeah, I see some familiar, somebody's getting attacked by a dog, it's super cute, um, I see some familiar faces there, but um, <clears throat> we're just super excited, um, we've been open um, just at four months, and um, the word is getting out, and we're meeting more and more people, um, And they're just, they hear us talk or they come to class and they're like, I can't believe this isn't taught everywhere to everyone, um, which is the exact thing that we think. So we're kind of excited that that they're getting that same feeling. So um, the way our program is set up, just super briefly, you're allowed to come full time five days a week, which is nine to four. And um, that's called, you know, PHP, but it doesn't matter. And then we have lower and lower levels. So our ideal situation is that you come full time five days a week, and then you step down to three or four days a week, and then progressively, you know, fewer and fewer classes. And um, we do allow people to remain coming to classes um, after they're technically finished. um, And they do, they haven't left us yet, which is really really fun and i think kind of unusual for rehab most people are ready to go as soon as they're they're able to go and the fact that they want to stay and hang out and you know drop in for classes and you know give up uh afternoons and evenings to come listen and and hang out and chat 
is, is a really cool thing and it's super gratifying because we feel like we're able to really dig deep and spread the principles and this innate health to the community that we live in, which ultimately hopefully will be a beautiful thing for, for where we live, where we raise our kids. So um, we're, we're super excited. Awesome. Me too, actually, because that's, that's a huge step forward for the, the three principles community. I mean, just you're reaching so many more people and, and spreading the message, and each one of them will carry it to more people, and that's, that's such an amazing thing. So what, what would you say is the, the key difference between what you guys do and what's typically done in a treatment center? <clears throat> so I'm the program director, so I um, uh, do most of the class facilitating, although um, I have a couple of other really amazing facilitators. Um, so like the primary difference is that most treatment facilities, most traditional treatment facilities, um, focus on the disease model and they really teach um, tips and strategies in order to um, like get through in order to deal with their addiction that they have no choice but to have to to struggle through um, and we see it differently we see it not as an addiction not as something that you have to struggle to to maintain your grip on or um, you know constantly work to to gain skills and 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 a toolbox that will help you just function through your addiction we teach um, an empowerment from an empowerment um, state of mind, which is that you know your addiction through understanding the principles of how you create your experience, your addiction just kind of falls away. You know those those bad habits that that you know seem to latch on um, that we seem to latch on to because they're a solution in the moment or they're the best solution that we have at the time to deal with emotional upset, emotional suffering, um, you know, depression, anxiety, all those things that, that everybody sort of struggles with at, at, at some level at some time before they understand how it all works. Um, you know, drugs and alcohol are a great, easy solution, you know, at, at some point, <laughs> at some, at, for some point. And um, the only thing that, that we teach is how to, um, number one, how that experience is created, where anxiety and depression and um, any emotional suffering comes from so that they're not having to battle just that one situation or, um, you know, move past this one bout of depression. When you understand it, it takes care of all of those things so that they're not constantly having to manage and, well, what was my step here? And, and what trick did I use to get over this? And, um, you know, where's my journal so that I can make sure to get all these feelings and emotions out. This just melts all of that away and recovery kind of becomes this effortless, um, journey as opposed to, um, this increasingly difficult, step by step thing that you have to do. Um, and I don't mean to say that recovery is effortless because certainly in the beginning, before you understand, there's a lot of resistance. This does seem counterintuitive to what we're told, to what we're taught. Um, but once we're, we're open to receiving that this is how it works and our clients see for themselves that, oh my gosh, you know, I have been mad before, I have been depressed before, I have been anxious before, and for some reason, I'm not attached to those. They were able to fall away. Um, and I don't still have to think about them and go through them in order to get over them. Um, they see that it's true for everything, so. Krista, you mentioned a word I'm not familiar with, mindfulness. What, what is that? What, how do you define that? So, Mindfulness, um, particularly in treatment, um, is really just a word that people tend to identify with. Um, it's, there's been a number of studies that show that mindfulness, just the, the act of paying attention to you know, the emotions that are in your body, the, the physical signs that show up when you are feeling stressed or anxious or depressed, rather than 
trying to cover those up and, and do something on the outside to change your situation. Just noticing that that's happening and sort of accepting that emotions, thoughts come and go um, allows you to not have to do anything to get rid of them. Um, so mindfulness is just that, that practice of um, becoming more aware of number one, that you think, and then number two, that what you think is creating emotions and, and physical uh, sensations in your body. Um, and so we do some meditation, although it's not required. Um, we do, um, you know, some yoga and some walking and stuff like that to, to try to help people slow down and get into their uh, out of their mind and back into what is real, the physical part of what's real. Um, but we do that in an effort to get them to slow down long enough so that they can hear the, the, the more important fact of the principles that this is how you created that experience. So if you're feeling anxiety, it means you have anxious thinking going on. And um, with attention, that anxious thinking gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have a full blown anxiety or panic attack. Um, whereas if you understand that, oh, you know, anxious thinking happens to everybody, depressed thinking happens ten, uh, to everybody. Um, you don't have to attach and identify with that thinking and, and say, oh, here it comes. I'm getting depressed again. Now what am I going to do? I need to go talk to somebody. I need medication. I need a drink, whatever. Um, so mindfulness is really just, I would say, the vehicle that we use to help people get more in touch with, with what's happening in their physical and mental uh, bodies in order to become more aware and then be open to the principles. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever worked with addiction, um, you know, trying to teach the principles to people who say have never heard of the principles, who aren't wowed by Michael Neal or Jamie Smart yet, have, are not yet wowed. <laughs> you know, they don't know Sid Banks. They're not necessarily coming to learn about the principles. So we have to get them to a place where they not only can listen, but um, are slowed down enough that they go, oh, you know, that other thing that they said was true. So now I'm more open and willing to, to pay attention to this other crazy stuff they say. And I, I think okay. mind, mindfulness, what, what you're going for in mindfulness is actually the same thing that people are going for when they reach out for whatever their substance of choice is. It's that quieting down of the mind. It's that letting go of all the, the stress and anxiety and stuff like that. It's just that eventually it isn't quite as effective as it was when, when you first start using and you end up with negative side effects depending on what it is that you're using and how much. Mm -hmm. you know, it, and like you said, it, in the beginning, it is quite difficult because there is a physical aspect to the there is a, a physical aspect to the use of all these chemicals and stuff. And it does take some time for the body to kind of, you know, settle down and get rid of all the, all the toxins and whatnot. But what, what you guys, what I like about, you know, your approach to this is you're dealing with the actual issue, which is, you know, you look at people who go through a traditional treatment center who go in for 60 or 90 days inpatient, and then they come out and they use again. At that point in time, there's no physical addiction to any chemical. It's gone. So I, I love the fact that you guys are getting to the core issue, which is really just the, the a simple misunderstanding of where our experience of life comes from. You know, it doesn't come from the outside, and it's not our circumstances that create our, our feelings. It's our thinking about those circumstances. And it sounds like such a such a simple little thing but it's it's made a, a tremendous difference in my life and, and many people that i know just that that simple understanding and at first it was it was almost too simple for me it was kind of like you know where are the you know the 12 steps or the 101 main points or something you know where's <laughs> where's the process and it, that's the the clarity that you two have with with communicating that is is wonderful and i'm so happy that you've been able to open up your own center which is just 
you're going to help a tremendous amount of people. I'm excited. <laughs> Would you, would you say mindfulness is sort of the edge of consciousness heading in that direction? Or is um, that a, a oversimplification? Well, the guy who uh, has made it incorporated into a therapeutic setting, John Kabat-Zinn, he defines it as paying attention on purpose to in the present moment. So it's pretty simple. It's, you know, the this thing is always here now and always providing feedback to now this thing. And I'm not pointing to my head or my lack of hair, but th th this <laughs> psychological <laughs> aspect is, is um, it's experience now, but um, it, it's a, a very tricky thing. And that uh, if, if people can begin to get a sense of the principles, the um, suddenly, they're able to, when we are mindful of what is right and not our, our imagination and our fairy tale, then um, intelligence seems to be infused in the process of thought. And when it comes, it is relevant to the unfolding situation. And suddenly thought is coming. And, I, and don't, Maybe this will make sense. Maybe you're like, this guy's crazy. I, I think that as, as I become quiet, then thought is coming from the situation. It's instead of being up here, not being grounded, thought creates the situations, right? So, um, Mindfulness helps illuminate that process that exactly like that, that a lot of people aren't aware of, particularly in the situations that they come to us in. Um, so it, it just helps them get out of their own head, helps them slow down and, and possibly stop creating all these extra situations so that they can actually be there to listen to the truth of the principles, the, the clarity and, and the wisdom that they have that we're just pointing to. So. And yeah, Sydney, not Sydney Banks was a proponent of meditation or anything that any healthy thing that you could do to kind of slow down your thinking because he knew that, you know, I mean, if you're caught up in your thinking the the it's very difficult after years and years and years of paying attention to nothing but your thinking to just suddenly stop. So it's, but the important thing is to realize that when you're meditating, you know, when you reach that state of meditation, what you're experiencing is not meditation. You're experiencing your true self, your core essence. That's all it does. You've dropped all that, that extra thought and all that, and you're just present. Mm -hmm. And that's the real you. Well, what it says to me is that I'm, I'm the creator. It, I'm responsible for what it is I'm feeling, and I still struggle with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. No. No. Okay. No, I think that, I think that there's a bigger picture. I think that uh, when I talk about this uh, order, there's a, there's an order to things, and and I think thought, when it's it's operating in a coherent way, has access to this intelligence, and that's how you know, people seem to solve their apparent problems, right? That are psychologically created when their minds are quiet and, and it allows for uh, insight to percolate up without having to be filtered through all of the memory when which thought is being projected out in, in our ordinary mode of thinking. So I am, uh, I really think that, uh, to, to say that I'm responsible for my anxiety. And I, that's like saying you got to qualify it because on a very, very relative sense, yes, what you're saying is I think is accurate. But like if I'm on uh, anybody ever watch that show survivor. Okay. So let's say that Chris and I are on the Island of survivor and we're doing an immunity challenge. Okay. Cause I'm voting her off. I got an alliance against her. And in that challenge, they say, 
It's real simple. All you got to do is hold this phone like this, sit, standing on your tippy toes, right? So I, I can do that for a while. It, and I could probably do it for a long time, but at some point uh, to sustain that, it, you know, some, it requires effort. Well, not only that, but somebody, um, I can't do that forever, right? If I feel that I can control thought, and I know you're not saying that, right? I understand that. But, but really, to say that I'm responsible for how I feel implies that somehow I can control thought, I think. You, we can't control thought um, no more than you can control blinking your eyes. If you tell your body, I'm going to take over, and I'm going to start doing this for you, so you don't have to do it anymore, right? You can only do that for a little while. Um, so I think you're not, you, in a sense, you're doing it to yourself, but at the same time, you're really not, but in understanding how it works frees you to, um, it just like touches something down here. So it moves beyond just this heady, uh, vocabulary, verbal understanding so that suddenly you just see it and then as you so possibly just becoming more and more sensitive because here's the deal we can't see we can't see thought only another thought can reflect and say that was a thought right in in the moment in the moment thought is always late so if we can't see thought then i say let's investigate and explore how to know what thought is doing right who gives a crap what what thinking is, you know, the particulars, what, what's happening, but let's become sensitive to what thought is doing. And that's why we got these, I mean, I don't have a beautiful body, but that's why we got these bodies so that we can become sensitive to how thought is informing and, and going on. And the more sensitive that we can become, the sooner that we can see when thought is doing you dirty, right? And then when, when thought's doing you dirty, suddenly it allows you to, to wake up and, and become and just notice, just the noticing of it, it dissolves it, right? Like if, if, if you go to, my buddy's got this RV and he went to check on it and it had been uh, infested. infested by rats, right? So if you go into a room that has rats and you turn the lights on, right? What, what the hell do they do? They run, right? Because they can't stand being in the light, roaches and rats. And this unhealthy thinking that occurs can't stand the light of being seen because it, it has no place to hide. And I think that, that that is becoming present is the light. Hi, this is Joan. Okay, if I say, add to this, it's really good talk. Yes, please. Um, I, really, um, I really appreciate the the feeling part of it, because that's what Sid was always saying, go to the feeling, go to the feeling. And what Harry was saying was, is this the, is mindfulness the edge of, of the mind? In a way, I, I think it's being more sensitive to that bigger, you know, the, the uh, non-form energy or the mind energy and kind of just feeling more in the present of that connection, because that's, that's where it is. I mean, it's not in my computer system of the brain and it's not living in the past, not living in the present or in the future, but this is all there is. And, um, and I agree, you know, I can't capture my thoughts cause I just thought that thought, but I can Sid said it's in the feeling. And I, I just really enjoy this, this flow of feeling right now. Thanks. Yeah. The, and to, to under, to, to see, like, if somebody says, listen for the feeling, right? You're like, what the hell does that mean? Well, if, here's how I see it. I think that my, my vocabulary that comes out is not a deliberate, uh, it's not deliberate. I don't, I'm not thinking of the words that I'm saying, right? So that I, th I feel that they're being informed. There's this meaning that is intended to communicate and this meaning becomes just absolutely pregnant and gives birth 
to the vocabulary, and the vocabulary is expressed to you. The words that I say do not mean anything at all other than to the degree, to, to the de depth of where they're informed. That's the meaning, and that is what needs to be communicated. So if someone else is quiet, then where I'm speaking from can, can touch something. It, can, it, it has a, a place to stick within them. Um, yeah. It's really, when we're in, in the quiet feeling, or what you're describing, or in the, in the now, the harmony just happens, and we see, we are, we are truth, we are experiencing, and we, it's the only time we actually see truth is when we're in that particular place. The rest of it just sounds to me like, in my own experience, is a lot of talk trying to figure out what it is, where when I'm in the moment, it is, and I know for sure it's truth. And that's about all I need to know, because if I keep following that feeling, I'm going to keep letting that energy express itself, and it gathers momentum, goes, starts to head in a very positive way, what I call a spiritual reality. And that's, that is what I feel we're all pointing towards in the end, is that we're, we're walking in a spiritual reality, but we need to have a psychological understanding. Yeah, I actually have a hand up here. Uh, Yehuda, you are unmuted, go ahead. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Yehuda. Oh. Well, now we can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe he could type his question, Greg. Yeah, for some reason we can't hear you. Go ahead and uh, type your question in and we'll, we'll get it on. But there's a baseline. So, how would you two define or describe addiction? Ah, good question. Um, I think it's a habit that you'd prefer not to have, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> like, it's, it's not, it's just like, uh, if I have a, a habit of biting my fingernails, right? And until until I can see that it is a habit for myself instead of listening to my wife, right? and I don't bite my fingernails, I'm using that as an example, then, um, then it, yeah, disclaimer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Pull your hair instead. Oh, yeah, I've done that, I guess, right? <laughs> but there's, uh, it's, it's, people, when, when we learn to drive a car, there's, um, it's a conscious effort. And when I say conscious, it feels very mechanical. Like if you learn to dance or play the piano, it's very mechanical, like right? Like we're teaching Carson. Yeah, like we're teaching our kid, you know? And it's, uh, I'm teaching him how to drive. And when he turns, wherever his head goes, like if he's, if he's looking into traffic, this thing's connected. So anyway. We got a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot going on in order for him to, to learn to do that. And then our freaking brains and, and minds are, are so incredibly efficient because they say, okay, it seems as if 
all of this goes together. So, and then it puts that somehow in memory and it becomes this sweet little chunked program that just happens, you know, like that. Like when your phone rings, you, you don't look to the TV, right? Or when you're watching TV and the phone rings, you don't look to your phone. Um, and so if someone experiences uh, an emotional pain, right? What they refer to as an emotional pain. So anxiety, right? Which we could go into that, but uh, they discover, wow, if I'm very clever, I can dole this apparatus so that somehow it interferes with how the two aspects to this one movement operate together, the mind and the body. Um, and when they dole it, it, um, it, it's a solution. It's relief. It's relief. Yeah. They're like, Oh, ka-ching. Yeah. I'll get another six pack. So in the very beginning, it is a conscious choice to have a drink or a drug unless, you know, there are, you know, somebody sticks a needle in, in your arm at a party or something, I guess, and get you addicted to heroin. I don't know, but I think that it is a choice, but it's a choice that's not informed with intelligence or understanding, right? So there, it, I don't, it, it, it's very sad. So I got a lot of compassion for them. And then very, very quickly, and everybody's different, that choice falls out of their awareness. So that thinking that once was mechanical to be able to go out with friends on the weekend or not, it, it, it's under the radar. So this stealthy, invisible thinking is chunked in this program and it's occurring just like, like that. So in the beginning, I think it's uh, a choice based on not all the information and certainly a misunderstanding of the interpretation of what the signals of the body are actually communicating. And then suddenly they're just caught in this trap. So this, this, uh, this lousy solution. And so our aim where we're at is to provide a healthier solution and test it for yourself. See if it works. I got a text this morning from a girl who only comes once a week, every Thursday night. And she texted and goes, Oh my God, everything's different. And she's only been coming three weeks. We may be doing too good of a job. So, um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, one of the things that we talk about is um, <clears throat> this this uh, view of addiction that, that society tends to have is this, you know, they're looking down on, oh, well, you know, I don't have an alcohol addiction or I've never had a drug problem. Um, one of the things that we, I think, really clearly illustrate in class is that, you know, I had an addiction to my own thinking. Um, I've had <clears throat> anxiety about perfection and, and, and my achievement. And while my addiction didn't come with the same um, health ramifications or any kind of legal ramifications, the mechanism that, that kept me addicted to my thinking was the exact same thing. And so, you know, when we, when we talk about addiction and we look down on people who, you know, well, why couldn't they just choose better or, you know, well, they did that to themselves. It's, it's really a, a sad thing because so many people have addictions that they're completely unaware of. Like, like you said, um, addictions to, to work or, you know, a partner or, um, you know, exercise or, <clears throat> um, being right, um, being addicted to being right. That's totally an addiction that, that needs to have a light shined on it. Um, and, and the mechanism, the, the thing that causes it is the same thing. So, um, like Joan pointed out in the group chat, we definitely discuss the neuroscience of that reward system. Um, I'm a super neuroscience geek. I love the fact that neuroscience literally proves what the principles are saying in a real and tangible way. So, you know, we have at the center what I call Science Friday, which I totally ripped off from NPR, but um, it's amazing. So uh, we talk about, you know, the the ways that meditation changes your brain and the neuroscience of addiction loops and how that reward center is lighting up. Um, and so 
understanding how all of that works with the principles gives you a real intangible way to say, okay, you know, that's just, um, my brain is crying out for a reward, you know, and if I've had addictions in the past that I've, um, covered up with, you know, alcohol use or drug use, um, my neurochemicals are going to be depleted for a while. I'm going to have to, you know, there are going to be some craving dreams, some craving thoughts that, that happen. Um, but with understanding that those thoughts, that urges are just thoughts, that cravings are just thoughts that come along with some, some physical symptoms, you know, um, they can see that it's not a thing that I have to follow. And one of the things that I love about um, John kabat quote unquote mindfulness thing is he talks about urge surfing, which is the fact that, um, any urge, any craving that you had typically only lasts for 15 minutes. And everybody thinks that it's like this thing that continually grows and grows and grows until you have to do something to stop it, to change it, to make it different. But the fact it, the, the actual fact is that it grows to a point, it hits a Zenith and then it, you know, tapers off on its own. We don't actually have to do anything about that. And that's, the nature of thought, which is just to flow, to, to, to clear itself out, to keep moving. And we're the ones that attach to that thing and, and say, well, I have to do something to stop it. I have to put something from outside um, to, to make it better, to make myself feel different. And that's just not true. Um, so yeah, no, we've, we've definitely um, seen the Bill Pettit talk and um, we use that as well as, um, you know, just all the current research. I'm constantly looking for stuff because it, it, it makes it make sense on a scientific level because obviously we have people that say, well, show me the proof that this is real, you know, other than just what you say. And, um, and we do talk about the allergic reaction. I see um, Yehuda, that was your question, um, the allergic reaction to alcohol and drugs. So we, we talk about that a little bit. Um, and yes. Could you explain that a little bit to you? Yeah. 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 Alcohol and drugs can lead to an allergic reaction that uh, ends up uh, with handcuffs. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, that was helpful. You no, that's it. Handcuffs. You break out in handcuffs if you <laughs> use drugs and alcohol. So what what the traditional disease model discusses is the fact that um, if you are an alcoholic, um, that once you have stopped use of alcohol, you can never use alcohol again, or else you have an allergy, like an allergy allergic reaction to the alcohol, which makes you unable to stop using alcohol again. And so I think that certainly points to levels of consciousness, anything that you're doing to this physical body. Um, I mean, caffeine changes your physical body um, and, and, and in turn affects the thinking, the quality of thinking that you have. Um, alcohol, drugs, um, smoking, whatever, that you are quote-unquote outsourcing your neurochemical needs to a substance from outside, um, it changes your level of consciousness. And so that does make sense even from a principal standpoint that if I have lowered my level of consciousness to where I've now, <clears throat> I'm even buzzed then I'm less likely to make a wise decision. I'm less likely to listen to my body and what it's telling me. Hey, this is probably not a good idea. Hey, this is, I could probably just take a walk. Um, I'm more likely to give into cravings. I'm more likely to give into the idea that I can't handle this. So I must do something from the outside. So if we want to discuss it in terms of that, um, I think that's a very real thing. I don't know that, taking one sip of alcohol makes because I actually have an, a, an allergy and a disease that, 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 uh, causes allergic reactions. And, um, I don't, I think all of the, 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 um, 
literature, all of the studies so far have been geared towards if an al a past alcoholic or recovering alcoholic takes another drink, they're more likely to drink. And I think that just makes complete sense. However, if you really truly understand where your level of consciousness, how it's changed, if you understand how your reality is created, you know, through your thinking, um, your participation in it, and how this body, this physical mechanism is a barometer to the quality of your thinking, then um, I think that, you know, if something happened and, and somebody forced you to drink a small amount of alcohol, you could still be in control. You could still be um, aware of what's happening and walk away. I don't think that it makes um, like a medical, life-threatening medical situation where you have to then go right back to drinking. Well, I don't Greg, know if that... Greg has experimented with that a little bit and he's actually found that it hasn't had that allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. And in my own, exp I'm not, I am never been an uh, addicted in, in that, in the sense of what we're talking about. But I, as my level of consciousness goes up, uh, the need, the effect and, and the need for drinking, I, I actually can't drink very much because my, my level protects me in a way where I like to drink a beer, but I can't drink past a half a bottle because I just, I just, it just, my body and everything just says, no, that's enough. And, and so on. So I, so basically as this, your level of consciousness goes up, your protection goes up, your mm -hmm. understanding goes up. And in Greg's case, he, he had such a huge experience. I hope I, I don't mind you talking about you, Greg, but had such a huge experience that he was able to see both sides of that conundrum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's refreshing to hear uh, because in truth, nothing controls us from the outside. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I, that's, oh, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I really truly believe that the only thing that that sends somebody back into that cycle of the habit is the thought that having another drink or whatever will do that just that idea of being put into their head that belief that they carry with them that if they have a drink they'll be right back to where they were or worse is actually what puts them there because then once you've had that one drink that thought pops in where it's kind of like, well, I had one, it's going to happen anyway, so I might as well just go for it. Whereas with what I've experienced myself is I actually tried, I tried, it was you know, about a year ago, so I actually tried getting drunk and I hated it. That's I couldn't I stand the feeling anymore. And it, it was, it was really a, an amazing experience because it, it solidified for me the fact that once your once your level of consciousness raises above the level of let me put this a different way what what i saw in my experience was the energy behind life the energy to everything and things everything has its own level of energy there's like a vibrational level it's all the same energy but the kind of vibrates at different frequencies is, is what i saw and you know something like like beer or a certain kind of drug or food or whatever has a vibrational energy to it and if my level of consciousness is below that level it will help me feel a little bit better for a little while but once my my level of consciousness rises above that it can only bring me down if that makes sense that's that's been my personal experience with it and when my wife left uh, earlier last, you know, beginning of last year, my level of consciousness dropped tremendously. I got caught up in my thinking and I, you know, and I, I had a really, I don't know, about six weeks of just being at a really low level of consciousness and I got drunk almost every day. Because at that point I had dropped below that level of alcohol. So for a short time it kind of helped me feel better. But the, the difference that time versus in the past when I was drinking every day was that I knew it was temporary. I knew it was just something I was going through and that it would pass on its own. 
and it did. And that's the beauty of it, is that there's nothing we need to do. It's a self-correcting system. As long as we, the, the biggest barrier that I see that people have is their beliefs. We get so caught up in, in our, the story of me, of who I am and what I should be doing and who I should be and all that kind of stuff. And we try to make things fit into that unconsciously. It's just, you know, it becomes one of those habits, those subconscious thought patterns. And once that breaks, when we become willing to let go of that story is when we can find that real freedom. And mindfulness helps with that because if, if you're in the present moment, you're not worried about who you should be. The story isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, Mail? Yeah. Mel had a. What's that? He's, Mel had a question. Yes, I, it, I've been a, a substance abuser for probably 40 years. Um, and I hit the rails about 20 years ago with cocaine. Um, this is before I came across the three principles. Um, and I dealt with it my own way and I got clean and I've been, and I was clear for about 10 years. But I, I actually do enjoy the effect of taking drugs. So I'm not going to be around the bush. I, I enjoy the experience of smoking, smoking marijuana. And I enjoy the effect of cocaine. And occasionally I'll, I will take a line of cocaine now. But I, it doesn't, you know, the, I might go out for a party and have, have a great evening. But then the next day, I don't have that return to must have it, I must have it. Yet, I could sit here right now and I can initiate the craving within myself that I'd really, 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 really want it. I really, really want it now. And I can, I, can, you know, I can feel my body being hijacked by my thoughts. But I know what's going on. Now, now that I understand where my experience comes from, I know what's going on and I can just dismiss it. And it's not, it's not an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things I, because I, at one point I, w I went to uh, Narcotics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous to, to try and deal with the situation that I was going through at the time. And I had a lot of issues with them. So you must stop everything. You can't take, you can't drink, you can't do this. But I've, never, I, I've never had an issue with alcohol. Um, I'll take it or leave it. And I just found that kind of the rigidity of it for me was very problematic. Whereas in my own way, I seem to have found, and then through the understanding of the three principles, I now knowing where the experience is coming from. I, and, and that it's I a spiritual, and it's a spiritual reality rather than a course. reality that I'm controlling. Of course, of course. And I've had some very, very profound, insightful, uplifting moments smoking dope. And I've also had some very, very terrible moments where I'm just an habitual user using it to fill, it, fill the, whole, you know, the vacant holes in my life. And I now realize that and that I don't go down, I don't go into those areas because I know that's what's going on so I can step away from it. That's my five, my, my two pence worth. Good two cents. Or two cents, yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> All right, make sure Chris with his hand up. Is... Go ahead, Chris, you're unmuted. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I was just, you know, when, when uh, what was just shared, uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, I've, I remember reading a story of, of Ram Dass, uh telling about his guru in India, and he was on LSD, and he gave his guru some of this stuff, and the guru didn't have any effect on him, not at all. And say, you know, what, you know, so, so, so there's something, go, something more, uh, there's something else going on than the drug. That was just what I was thinking of. There's, there's, so, that, there's, so what is it, you know? And, and uh, consciousness, I guess, is, is, is the answer. What I was going to say before when I heard you talking about mindfulness and, and the principles is that uh, I think it's pretty obvious that, that, uh, that bridging the kind of uh, neuroscience with the with the with the principles yeah of course it's very very it's very it's very um important and for me the, what my latest insight has been is that it's all about kind of uh, slowing down <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's so simple if 
because because you're going too fast. You don't see the road, do you? Uh, are you, are you, you kind of get wanting to get somewhere you aren't yet, or so? So just slowing down enough to to that, that, that you can feel uh, what's going on in your life. And if you have too much uh, speed going on in your nervous system, I guess, or uh, you, you or, or you, you you get you get. Um, you, you get pretty pretty bad at driving or at kind of t- decisions or anything because it's, you have you don't have enough data or enough information to to be why you can you don't you can't really listen to yourself either so slowing down uh, and um, so I, I've been teaching uh, uh, people with ADHD at one point I was teaching them about um, ADHD and 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 one of the things, one of the exercises we we did was walking outside and and noticing the you know the scenery without your smartphone. <laughs> and some of them said, "I never tried that before." You know, it, it's been like you know all all kinds of stuff going on all simultaneously, and just kind of deliberately taking the speed off the gas. And uh, life gets more real, doesn't it? And you start being get, get smarter, and you and you're realizing, oh, oh yeah, this is me. I'm here. That this is my life. Instead of you know just being uh, being a Speedy Gonzalez. But that was just my five cents. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. Good work, Chris. While you were talking, I would define addiction as a speedy mind. Yeah, you know, to be, to be honest, uh, you know, obviously, what what the Smiths are talking about is 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 a quieting down into into what truth or reality is, and as you step back, heading back home, you you start your your understanding or your feeling or your perception starts to starts. To, I call it. I'm. I'm Oh, there, there you are again. Me, I, Harry is there again. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's very simple. <laughs> All right, we have uh, Jeff. Jeff actually has his hand up. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. You're unmuted. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, no, Chris uh, and Reed. It's really nice to see you guys again. It's been a very long time. Uh, you too. Uh, what I wanted to say with regards to uh, Chris talking about slowing down, uh, some of you know that I've been kind of hosting um, peer um, a local three principles meeting that have run from oh, a dozen people to in some cases nearly five dozen people. They last for 90 minutes. And in many cases, the, the people that show up, they're have never heard of the principles. They don't know who Sid Banks is. They, they, they don't understand anything about this. And when I was early in my experience doing that, um, it, people get really cognitive <laughs> about trying to wrap their head around their principles. And what I've discovered is that um, um, there's nothing to wrap your head around. It's as though you're standing in, in ankle deep in water trying to figure out how to make your feet wet. It, <laughs> the principles just exist and it's a matter of seeing them. And, and so very early in my experience with, uh, with that group, uh, I, I, uh, in an effort to help people to slow down their minds, I, I, I just did a, a kind of a three to five minute um, 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 situational awareness meditation um, it, it, can you feel your breath uh, can you feel your weight on your chair can you hear the fan um, circulating air in the room can you hear the clock tick um, and, and suggest to people that they do that and, and all of a sudden and it's been for uh, over four years uh, it, it's like nobody wants to argue again uh, Tom's been at dozens of, of those meetings when he lived here in town and it's all of a sudden there's not a cognitive bias that you have to overcome if the people that you are um, 
speaking with are, are, are already slowed down. And, and I have found that to be exceedingly helpful in, um, um, in setting people up to, and we use a little brochure. I want to be sure that we're all using the same language. And so we read uh, uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes from this little brochure. But uh, before anything starts, uh, we do it do this, this um, situational awareness meditation that I probably ripped off from, oh, uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, Sam Harris. And um, um, it, 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 it seems to be extremely helpful. And I certainly don't intend to tell you two how to run your classes, but, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I use that with good effect. And... Um, and it it's, uh, seems um, to have been helpful. Um, that's all. If you start teaching people when their mind is already slowed down, um, it, 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 it seems like it's useful. Great. I, ha I have a question to the Smiths, something that I'm curious about. Um, uh, uh, you, one of the things that you, you alluded in your article was that it that it was in the traditional model, they, they go into sort of a treatment bubble and then they have trouble adjusting once they leave the treatment to real life or to, re, to reintroduce themselves into uh, what we call, uh, you know, job uh, relationship life type of thing. And uh, I would love to hear what you have to say about that because it sounded like you you've looked at that a little bit and I and it's something that's very very prevalent on my mind of, of how do we how do people effortlessly trans 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 move over to whatever you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah well <clears throat> I think it's undeniable if we look at our prison system that time is not the solution right time in the material sense if i hire a bunch of people to go dig a pool in the backyard right and then i don't get my bonus for the year and then i have to tell them to fill it back in it, it takes a lot of time for this to to happen and the problem is we borrow the logic from our material world and we carry that into our psychological world right? Because we think they operate by the same rules. So people who go to prison for 11 months and 29 days and get out and immediately use an overdose is very, very common. People who are, uh, the recidivism rate of drug offenders is through the roof. It's over, I think, 80%. And that is a testament to, and, and so also that care is over into residential treatment. If you go into a residential treatment model and all your needs are taken care of and you don't have to cook for yourself and everything's taken care of and you got and everything's fine then that's not a, a real life situation real life right so you're in this bubble and then when you go home you got to meet with your family you got to like if, if you're on the phone at the treatment center i'd always hear people slamming the phone on their relatives right hanging up on them as soon as they heard something that didn't fit into their image that they had of themselves when the image we have of ourselves and the information coming in doesn't line up it creates friction we feel that and then our all they would do is try to eliminate the friction by eliminating the the contact we right? broke phones all the time yeah they broke damn phones all the time they seriously so uh in in what we're communicating here at least it's a, a real-time recovery where they come, they explore, we, we really go into these things and then they get go home and they talk to their family and they live their life and then they come in the next day and go, man, what we talked about yesterday, this is what how I saw it play out. So that, that's the thing. But here's why, here in my opinion, right? Uh, everything that I say obviously is, but if, so Einstein's quote, and everybody loves to quote the damn thing. It's really famous, right? You can't solve your problems. It's, it's, you, the same level of thinking that created them. Right, or the same level of consciousness. So what does that really mean? Here's what I think it means. So we're, we're moving along a line of thought. And, it's, and then so thought suddenly 
moves into an unhealthy direction, right? It no longer is available to the intelligence. So as thought becomes circular, intelligence is a part of the whole system. So it just communicates through the body, right? And so then the body is very intelligent. The body doesn't speak language. It doesn't understand English, right? So it has to be communicating this universal truth. And then so if thinking is happening and suddenly it moves in a very unhealthy direction, it goes to the body to try to wake us up to how untrustworthy it is. If we don't understand it's coming from here, first off, as human beings, we have this conditioned reflex that has been formed over our lives so that when we experience an uncomfortable feeling, the reflex, the impulse says, let's solve the emotional problem, right? Seeing it as a problem. Well, the impulse generates additional thinking, but the thinking is at the same level of the thinking that created the unhealthy feeling in the first place, right? So then it just comes out here and it, and it goes, yeah, man, that crazy thinking caused all this. I'm going to help you solve it. But it's moving along at that same level, right? And that's what prison, unless somebody's very fortunate or Bill W with the 12 steps to have an insight and, and suddenly see his situation from this higher perspective to where it makes no longer makes sense to drink. Bill W had an insight. All we're trying to do is help people have an insight because an insight isn't about the, the particulars, but it's about the general process. And in doing so, it, there's this vertical shift in understanding. And then suddenly you can deal with things. And I think even from a, like a neurological standpoint, that's been proven to be true. So whenever we have thinking that creates emotional responses within the body, your body is hardwired to shut down those higher higher level thinking, higher level um, reasoning abilities, because um, when you sense, when your body senses danger and your body doesn't know the difference between, you know, <clears throat> a pit bull trying to attack you and just your mom being really vicious. So you, it stuff shuts down because it's just thinking your body is saying, Hey, we have to survive this really fast. And so from a neurological standpoint, that's like completely proven. We shut off all that higher order rationing reasoning ability. And we just were here trying to deal with this emergency, not really realizing that it's not necessarily a survival emergency. It's just your mom or it's just work or it's just whatever it is we're thinking about in that moment that's caused that problem. So when we do um, have this program where people go home every day, they're proving it to themselves little by little by little every single day. So they even do come in and say, hey, you know what, last night I was all prepared, you know, I was, I was being mindful, I was, um, you know, sort of being in the zone and, uh, you know, something happened and it was just too much and I got haywire everything went crazy. Um, I lashed out at my wife, you know, I yelled at my kid, whatever. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this is that thing that we were talking about. So I pulled back, you know, so even if it's not necessarily, um, that they go home and every day is a win because I mean, let's face it, it's not even those little things that they, that they're going through day by day that they wouldn't have in residential rehab where everything's taken care of for them. You know, they don't have to think about bills or work or, you know, sitting at that annoying school play that they don't want to be at or whatever. These little things they're able to go through prove little by little, Hey, you know, that was much better than I thought it was going to be. My dinner with my in-laws wasn't quite as terrible as that usually is, you know, and I and think it maybe have something to do with the fact that I was just present with my mother-in-law for the first time ever. And, you know, so it's, uh, it eliminates that, that, uh, that false sense of security that you get sometimes in, um, in a residential, which we both had worked in for a number of years, um, because they have all this quote unquote success built up, but it's not based on anything that they actually have to go through in their real lives. And then when they go home and it's like, holy crap, I forgot how annoying this was. And I forgot how stressful bills were. And I forgot, you know, 
about this daily grind, you know, that I've been romanticizing for the last two months. Um, we didn't realize at first how important that would be, but man, this outpatient thing is like, like I said, our ideal situation is that they come for full time and then progressively, you know, less and less, and then just as often as they need to, so that they're coming in with, you know, hey, I've got this thing coming up, how, you know, uh, how would you look at it? What do you think about this situation? Here's this amazing win that I had. And it's just reinforcing for them over and over that this is how it works. And then, um, then they don't need us anymore, which is pretty sad. And it, it gives people an opportunity to practice, which is something that's underestimated in the three principles because everybody thinks, well, I've got this nice feeling and they walk out, but they still have their thoughts. And you, if you don't practice life, to, in, you're, you're not going to, if it, you're not going to experience what the natural flow of the way life is going to teach you. Right. The other way, you're thrown in into a cold situation, and the whole thing is coming at you. Mm -hmm. I can imagine how unbelievable that must be to deal with on a just on a mental level. Well, it's almost like if you're taught to ride a bike using videos and using other people's language and using, you know, here's what you do. You get on the bike, you center in the middle, you pedal these, you know, this way. And you think, man, I will totally rock that. I've got it, you know, and then you get out and you're like, oh my gosh, this is way harder than I thought. And you just fall over. There's nothing to do, but you know that the first few times that you ride the bike, there is some conscious thought and practice that, that you have to balance and then once you balance it's effortless and you're done but you're right I think it does get overlooked that there's that initial let's get a feel for what this is like in my own life for my own body for my own mind and then after that I don't have to think about it anymore so yeah we're we're learning how to ride a bike <laughs> all right do you guys have time for one more question Sure. All right, yeah, Joan asked. Uh, go ahead, Joan, you're unmuted, I think. Actually, it won't let me unmute you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I have, you know, some thoughts on, this is great sharing, hope you don't mind me talking so much, um, that insight is so very personal, specific to a person's um, living in, in, the situations now, and I really appreciate yours as outpatient because Sydney Bank always said life is a contact sport, and I, I think to me that what that means is, it, it this is how I'm going to grow into more of an understanding, of you know what this thing called life and richness is, and appreciation. I, I really like the metaphor about bike because I always think that's you know the balancing act is what I'm trying to do to achieve more harmony, I guess with. Um, you know, divine mind, get my kind of ego up a little less and less in my face. Um, the other thing was I had chat, put on chatter about how counselors often talk about get sober, get sober. And it's so, such, sounds like such a serious and um, boring kind of place to be. And so I was kind of brainstorming what three principles has brought to me is um, how to have more clarity. And I just, if that has a light feeling to it, to me, to have clarity about, about um, this reality. And I guess the last thing I wanna share is um, that the neuroscience is showing us that we create a picture of reality in the moment with all the data in our brain at using, you know, in relation to what the quality of the senses are. But I, I see this as the evolution of humanity because the, the intellect of our culture is so is so strong we really want to know we have to find out we have to put everything in species and gen you know genres everything has to be defined by human terms but with neuroscience is just an evolution into now that we can have a computer on our phones that it's really all about being in the moment and in relationship it's sort of like where the rubber meets the road we're all interconnected and um to kind of you know, move us along. It gives us peace, kind of like a way of communicating with the words of current science 
into something that even I love Krista when you said, when we talked like this, you know, this crazy stuff, because I um, have had that, ex you know, experience. I, so I really like that Jeff has such a successful group because I tried a group with my Unitarian Universalist Fellowship just last Friday and nobody came. And I was kind of disappointed, but you know, I've also felt like that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm cool with that. It's not my ego into it. I'm just throwing it out there um, as, a, as a way of um, healing in a way because a, a nurse friend of ours in our community committed suicide and, and, and it was, she was really involved with 12, the 12 steps and for years and years. And so that after her funeral, the next day I was inspired to get courageous to at least put it out there and offer it my home. But, um, but I, you know, I, uh, excuse me just a sec. Do you know what that experience teaches you? That experience teaches you that you'll have appreciation when people do show up. And appre you. appreciation is the most important thing in life. Gratitude and appreciation is, in my estimation, is the most important thing. And if one person shows up, you'll go, oh, fantastic. And oh. yeah, so that's, that's, that's a beautiful experience you're going through. And because your heart is good, you'll, you're experiencing that in, in the right way. And when people show up, you'll kiss them. That's oh, Mary, thank you. And indeed at fellowship today, I, um, a woman came up to me and asked for me to loan her the book. of Because um, I bought five copies of Sid's um, The Missing Link. And so I'm going to loan it to her. And I, I did feel grateful. And I really, I... I find myself um, having more gratitude uh, in just in just even these groups. So thanks you, thank you Harry, thank you Greg, thank you Krista, and you know her husband whose name is missing, <laughs> Smith. Reed. Reed, I apologize. Thank you. I'll, just, I'll close with that. You could just say that guy. He knows. <laughs> That's fine. Maybe you guys <laughs> could, could. Maybe you guys could sum up a little bit and. Uh, uh, you know, a little something. I, I didn't hear the name of your recovery center, which would be nice just just to put that out. And uh, yeah, how can uh, people get a hold of you about that if they're interested? Sure, our place is called Centered Recovery. Centered. Mm -hmm. So you could go to centeredrecovery.com, and our phone number is on the website, and it rings directly to me. So if anybody's got any questions or whatever then feel free to uh, and, and, and use that guys the idea is he probably reed would probably quite be quite pleased oh yeah i enjoy talking yeah, <laughs> yeah you know so don't be afraid if you like w the feeling that they're talking about don't be afraid to 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 do them and if you have somebody who's having a little bit of problems in this area and you like the feeling that reed and Krista are giving out, then I would at least talk to them about about this. Or, you know, to be honest, talk to Greg as well, because, you know, these are the subject matter experts that really know what they're talking about, or at least have a certain big background in it. And uh, we can certainly tell that there's a beautiful feeling coming from both Greg and from Krista and uh, Ah, from all of us. My, why should I give you guys credit when it's just all of us? So, <laughs> so uh, excuse me. Go ahead and wrap it up, guys. <laughs> um, well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we're obviously super passionate about what we do, and we're super lucky to be able to work in a place where it never feels like work. Um, we just get to do what we love every day, and people show up, which is, um, we're super grateful for. And, um, that's it. I guess. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming on to this. It was a, a great discussion and just a good feeling here today. I love it. Yeah. And thanks everybody for, uh, for participating at uh, Tom, Joan, Yehuda, Mel, Chris, and Jeff all joining in. So that's great. And, and next uh, week, make, mention next week, just who we have. It just slipped my mind here. You go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, doc, uh, Keith, Dr. Keith Blevins is coming oh, yes. on next week. And, uh, you mean in two weeks? Two weeks, excuse yes. me. <laughs> next session. Look forward well, to seeing you guys. 
Yes, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute everybody so you can say goodbye and thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day. Smitties! <laughs> it's wonderful to be all together again. Ah. Yeah.